only one life to offer, Jesus my Lord and King, only one tongue to praise Thee, and of Thy mercy sing, only one heart's devotion, Savior, oh may it be, consecrated alone to Thy matchless glory, yielded fully to Thee. Only this hour is mine, Lord, may it be used for Thee. May every passing moment count for eternity. Souls all about are dying, dying in sin and shame. Help me bring them the message of Calvary's redemption. In thy glorious name. Only one life to offer. Take it, dear Lord, I pray. Nothing from thee withholding. Thy will I now obey, Thou who hast freely given, Thine all in all for me, Claim this life for Thy love, To be used my Savior, Every moment for Thee. I had a private secret message to tell Brother Brantley that I didn't want the NSA to get a hold of in case they might hold it against me later. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Thank you for that song, Brother. I want to uh, invite you to turn with me to my text verse today, which is Proverbs chapter... I'm sorry, you folks may take a place out in the... Uh, I started to say Fellowship Hall. Oh uh, man, what am I doing here? You can take a place out in the auditorium, not the fellowship hall just yet. Uh, I invite you to my text verse for today, which is in the book of Proverbs, uh, chapter number 14 and verse number 34. And uh, I wanted to bring kind of a message that would hopefully have something to do with uh, nations, since uh, our country's uh, anniversary was this past July 4th, the anniversary of the Declaration of Independence anyway, and I felt like it would be in order to bring a message kind of along the lines of a nation, and yet I would like to say that what this verse has to say, which is true of nations, is also true of homes and of a family name. It's true of individuals, and it is true of churches also. Now, before I actually read the text verse, I'm going to ask you to keep your finger there and turn back with me, please, to Deuteronomy uh, chapter number 11. And I will read just a few verses there, and then I'll also read a couple of verses out of Joshua chapter number 8. In the Bible, there is kind of a theme of if you do God's commands, if you follow the Lord, if you go ahead and live the way that the Lord would have you to live, uh, the life is going to be blessed. It is going to be better, in other words. It's not that you won't have any problems because our problems are brought on to strengthen us, to make better Christians out of us. They're more precious than gold which perisheth. Um, but certainly, I ask you to bear me witness now, there is a thread throughout the entire Bible 
that if one will get with the Lord and walk with the Lord and follow God's guidance, His commands, uh, live a holy life, there is to be a blessing. And on the other side of the coin, if one does not get with the Lord, if one does not follow the ideals of the Bible, if one negates a holy life, there are to be the various curses or the various negative aspects of that life. Now, I'm sure you can all agree with me on that one way or the other, to whatever degree it is, it is most certainly in the Bible, and we must take it as such. This is seen, first of all, in Deuteronomy chapter number 11, and I'm reading in verse number 26. Here, before going into the Holy Land, God told his people, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee into the, un, into the land whither thou goest to possess it, that thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Now, for whatever it's worth, that is just for illustrative purposes when he uses those two mountains. But it's an illustration that also has a kind of truth behind it of course, the closer you got to the Mount of Blessing, the more blessing there would be. The further you got away from the Mount of Blessing, the closer you would get to the Mount of Cursing, and the more cursing there would be. And then also, over in the book of Joshua, please, after they had uh, gone on into the land, in Joshua chapter number 8, I just want to read... Uh, verse number 33, And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side the ark and on that side before the priests of the Levites. That's not Noah's ark, by the way, but the ark of the covenant. And uh, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord as well as the stranger as he that was born among them. Everybody was included half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them over against Mount Ebal as Moses the servant of the Lord had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. I read that verse to bring to our attention that um, if I may and I know this is going to seem like I'm stretching it and I am just a little bit but I think it will get the idea across. Half of them stood over against the Mount of Blessing, and half of them stood over against the Mount of Cursing. Now, by way of hermeneutical interpretation, we have the idea that God was showing the difference. He was using this for illustrative purposes. The point I want to make of it is in the day that we live in, about... 1% are standing over by the Mount of Blessing and about 99% I fear are standing over against the Mount of Cursing. They talk much about the 1% in our world today and the 99%, well I got to tell you, uh, the percent that's going to count ultimately is that percent that are trying to understand and realize that with the Lord Jesus Christ there is a blessing and without the Lord Jesus Christ there is trouble. Now having said that I want to read what is my text verse because it kind of illustrates these two mountains, it kind of illustrates these two extremes, it kind of illustrates the point uh, that I'm trying to make about blessing 
versus trouble, blessing versus cursing. And while I want to make mention of this, that God really doesn't have to do any judging process to us if we get away from Him because we'll judge ourselves automatically. I think we should remember that we do serve a God who does get to the point where He does unleash His judgment. You know, folks, I'm afraid that even in many Christian circles, the judgment of God has been so watered down that people need not fear the Lord anymore. You want to remember the Bible teaches that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and it is the beginning of knowledge. Having said that, then I want to read verse 34 of Proverbs chapter number 14. And here's what that particular proverb says. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Now then, as I've already mentioned, clearly we have the thought process here that going with the Lord, walking with the Lord, has its privileges, has its blessings, and going against the Lord, walking in the flesh, is going to have its automatic negatives. There is this blessing, which in Proverbs 14.34 is spoken of as righteousness exalts or sin reproaches. That is doing right, that is godly living exalts, and by the same token that is trouble and reproach come about by sin. And of course sin is breaking the law of God the law entered that the offense might abound. Uh, praise the Lord, but where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And uh, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We praise God for that. But we still need to remember that sin has its wages. Of course, the greatest of which is eternal death away from God Almighty, that eternal death in hell fire. That sin also has its wages on this earth, if I may so say. It is wise for us to think along these lines that righteousness exalts not only a nation, but also a home, a family name, a individual and individual, and I'd like to say that also righteousness, walking with the Lord, will exalt a church, but by the same token, sin is a reproach. Now, while it is pretty easy to explain righteousness exalts, I think you would uh, pretty well get the idea out of that. It is good for me to spend just a moment on the business about sin being a reproach. Uh, actually, the Hebrew word translated reproach there has the idea associated with it of censor or censorship. It actually has the idea of condemning. Now you all probably get the idea of censor because we often think of that in regards to various media processes around the world uh, censoring or getting rid of certain pieces of news or taking this out or that out. Uh, the idea being for our purposes this morning about sin is that sin is going to censor a nation before God. The idea for our purpose this morning is that sin is going to censor a church before God. Uh, the idea is that sin 
is going to censor an individual before God. And I want to say that whenever we think of righteousness, we obviously think about the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? Now, if I could cite Romans chapter number 4, which you may read that when you get home later today. In Romans chapter number 4, we have the righteousness of Christ being counted for the individual when the individual comes to Christ as their Savior. You're not seen before the Father in your own righteousness, praise God, but you're seen as in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We all ought to be thankful for that because we're all a sorry mess when we're seen in ourselves. But it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we are seen in. But our God is not only interested in our positional righteousness, which is what I refer to when I think of imputed righteousness and our salvation, but our God is also interested in our practical righteousness in this life. Or I may put it this way, please. God is not only interested in our soul going to heaven, and that's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that we need. We need to be saved. We've got to have our hearts washed in the blood of the Lamb if we're going to heaven. But I say, and I think you'll bear me witness on this, that our God is likewise interested in how we live our lives now in this earth. Right living versus wrong living. It is right for us to understand that the right living has to do with being saved, uh, but it is also to be translated, I say, into Christian lifestyle. Is that not a fair and correct statement? I repeat that if I may. It is good for us to be saved. I'm glad I'm going to heaven and I know God's glad of it because the Bible teaches there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents, right? But I am also interested in this and I think God is interested in this also. Our God is interested in our right living while we are here. Our living for the Lord and Savior Jesus. Jesus Christ while we are here. After all, we're not our own. We're bought with a price. If we're going to be biblical, we are not free to set our own standards. We ought to be getting our standards out of the Word of God. And so it is that I, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, am not only interested in seeing people saved and come to the Lord, but I also am interested in how people people live their lives as the children of God. And you may say, Brother Burke Holder, that's none of your business. Yes, it is. Because Ephesians says he gave some pastors, teachers, for the edification of the saints, for the purifying of the church of Jesus Christ. So what the church people do is partially my business. It's kind of like this, if I may borrow the illustration from the life of D.L. Moody. It is said that in Chicago one day a man looked at Moody and a fellow who was a drunkard and told Moody, hey, there, there's one of your converts. And Moody is supposed to have said to him, yes, that was one of my converts instead of one of God's converts. Now you can forget that point of it again. The point I want to make of it is just this. The guy told Moody, there's one of your converts. And what the church does that I pastor does have a reflection upon the pastor like it or not. And so I say that it is my business how I teach the scriptures, whether or not I can inspire you and encourage you to live for Jesus Christ our Lord, whether or not I can come up with nurturing and nourishing messages that hopefully will be translated into vitamins for the Christian life whereby you come into a closer walk with the Lord, whereby you come into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ, while, uh, whereby you lay aside the sin and the weight that so easily besets us and whether or not you take on those things that are going to bespeak of the glory of Jesus Christ in your life. I ask you to bear me witness in this vein at least. It is the preacher's business to preach holy living from his pulpit. 
Not just the evangelistic message, but a holy lifestyle as well. For instance, I'd like you to consider with me these precious scriptures, if I may. And I'm going to read these quickly. You might want to write them down and look them up in your devotional time later, if you would like. I will, for time's sake, read them quite quickly. I will be asking you to turn to some, but most of them I will just read. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Peter 1.15 But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Verse 16 Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Romans 12 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is not unreasonable for God to ask that of us. That's what that verse means, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. And i got to tell you, I fear quite often that about 95% of the professing Christians are too busy conforming to this world rather than looking at what the Lord Jesus Christ would have them to be. The Bible says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Not a 99% worth, but perfect will of God is what the Bible has to say there. Let me go into Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And I want to repeat, as I've said just recently in one of my messages, many people believe that cloud of witnesses are the prophets and the people who have gone on before us. And they're in the sky looking down on us, watching what we do. Also included in that cloud of witnesses is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, looking down and seeing what we do. And I'm going to say that that certainly has its merit. But I want to tell you one thing. There are a great many literal witnesses out there looking at our Christian lives as well. Like it or not, that's the way it is. Brothers and sisters, there is a whole world out there that is looking on us. And when we profess the name of Jesus Christ and do not act like it, what does the world say? You're a hypocrite. If I can borrow from one minister, he said, why is it that so many in the world say there are hypocrites in the churches? He gave the answer without waiting for an answer from the congregation. He gave the answer is because there are hypocrites in the church. Amen. We're compassed about with a great cloud of witnesses. And if you don't know how to live for the Lord, ask the world out there. They can give you some pointers. Let me go further. We're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight. Not part of them. Not the ones we don't necessarily like or the ones that don't appeal to us, but every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. I got to tell you, uh, folks, uh, your sin will find you out. Uh, you're going against the Lord is going to have its consequences somewhere down along the way. The sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Second Peter 3.11 Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. 
That's all this stuff in the world that isn't going to amount to a hill of beans when God gets through with it. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Conversation is often thought of as what we say with our mouths, and rightly so. Let us think of it in that way. In other words, you need to watch your mouth. Uh, my mother used to talk about washing mouth out with soap. Did any of you guys ever hear that expression before? Don't raise your hands or, or shake your head or look at your wife or your husband. How many of you have ever needed your mouth washed out with soap? I got to tell you folks, righteousness exalteth, but sin censures us before God. That's the way it is. Let me go further in my reading here, please. Conversation not only has the idea of our speech, but it has to do also with what we convey with our life and our lifestyle. 2 Peter 3.14 Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, what things? The second coming of Christ. Be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Ephesians 5.27 I'm going to ask you to turn with me to this one, please, because uh, it's got some other things there that I want to look at also. In the book of Ephesians chapter number 5, as I cited last week, I want to cite this week emphasizing the business about the Lord and the church. Now here's what we say in verse 25 first. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Look at the extent that he is interested in now. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be homely and with, uh, I'm sorry, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now that's pretty tall order, brothers and sisters, but that's what it says. Whatever else you get out of it, you ought to be able to get this out of it. God is interested in how we as his children live our lives on this earth. I believe that it is important for us that we understand the church is already saved. Now I realize there's a professing church that isn't saved at all. But the true church of Jesus Christ is already saved and it's that crowd that he's trying to present without spot and without wrinkle holy and blameless before the Lord. Our Lord is interested in how we live our lives. Now the time is going by too fast. I needed a whole series of messages on this thing. But I'd like to put it this way. If our Lord is interested in how his people lives, live their lives and he has set pastor teachers over the church then it looks to me like the pastor teacher ought to be interested in how God's people live their lives. And it looks to me like we ought to have some standards for holy Christian living. That's one reason why I try to have some standards for Sunday school teachers. I, I don't get very far. I feel like sometimes I'm trying to fight a losing battle. But that's why I believe that leaders in the church and those in... Uh, uh, a kind of position, a leadership role, need to have some holy living about themselves because you're an example to somebody. Somebody's going to get an idea of a Christian through you. Uh, I, I believe that somebody might say, well, Brother Burke Colder, you're just a legalist. I'm going to borrow from Johnny Pope again. What do you want to do, be illegal? I didn't say that, he did. I just borrowed it from him. I did think it was good. I think God's people ought to be interested in living a holy life. Man, uh, you say, well, Brother Burke Holder, it's not what's on the outside that counts. It's what's on the inside that counts. The inside counts, doesn't it? Because God looketh on the inside. 
we ought to be thankful for that because of the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. But man looketh on the outward appearance. Never forget that. And you say, well, Brother Burkholder, uh, you're just an old fogey, and you're the first member of the order of Neanderthal Club, and rightly so. You ought to be the one to head it up. Well, that may be, but I'm calling on Christians just not to get saved, but to live a holy life for the Lord. What you do and what you don't do does make a difference. But I realize that some people will say, well, it really doesn't matter what you do on the outside. It's, it's what you do on the inside. Well, now hold the phone just a minute. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Right? And you know, folks, I think it's important for us to realize a couple of things. There are a lot of things that aren't spelled out in the Bible, the do's and the don'ts. They're not spelled out. I think God fig figured we ought to have enough sense to be able to figure some stuff out for ourselves. Even though I got to admit the spiritual IQ seems to be at an all-time low, if you want my opinion, in the day that we live in. But I got to tell you this, if I may. People may say, well... Uh, uh, Brother Burke Colder, it's still the inside that counts. Ultimately, in going to heaven, that's true, but the outside counts down here. And this, this is something we ought to get through our thick skulls. Uh, well, let me put it this way, if I may. I got an article here out of the uh, Austin American Statesman. Uh, man challenges Texas same-sex marriage ban. Did you guys see that out of the... American statesman. Now listen, brothers and sisters, we didn't get to where we are overnight. We got that way step by step. Now, frankly, same gender business is spelled out in the Bible. But a lot of things leading up to it may not necessarily be spelled out, but I think God figured we ought to have some sense on our own to use our heads for something besides a hat rack and to get with him and to have spiritual discernment. I am amazed at the lack of so much spiritual discernment in this day that we live in. And I'm thinking to myself here, take us the foxes, the little foxes that get in and destroy the vines. Where would you get that, brother? It's biblical. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, and verse number 15. Now, listen. You could take the Ten Commandments. That pretty well spells some stuff out. Of course, it's only a very small part of the law in the Old Testament. But it pretty well spells stuff out. But I'm trying to report to you, generally, it doesn't happen overnight. Generally speaking, it happens by a process of little events that lead up to a big event. For instance, one guy usually doesn't just decide to get a gun and rob a bank. It starts out with something small, generally, and leads up to the big. How often has that been repeated in our society? Even I was reading a secular article earlier this morning about the, uh, I don't know, whatever you think about it, I'm not going to argue, about the spine of the NSA on, on the world, on American citizens and so on. And it says that it's going to lead up to something bigger. Now whether or not you agree with that, I'm not going to argue, but even the world knows it starts somewhere and gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Take the economic situation, for instance. One man that I read after had to say that the business of the Cyprus bank account raiding, hope you guys are familiar with that, is just the beginning. What does that mean? 
Even the world recognizes, take us the foxes, the little foxes that get in and destroy the vines. What am I trying to get at here today? The little things do amount to something, and it is a process of things. And what is on the inside does amount to something, and I'm going to have to come to a close by using this illustration, if I may. In Matthew chapter number 5, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ used the illustration about adultery and he said, uh, you say don't commit adultery, but now you'll remember this part, but I say unto you, whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her in his heart hath committed adultery already. Do you remember that one? In other words, it wasn't the actual thing, but it was something that was going to lead up. And I'm, I'm trying to point out, folks, as a concerned minister, that we don't all of a sudden just quit the Lord. We don't all of a sudden just get out of church. It usually starts on Wednesday night or visitation or something like that. And all of a sudden, a guy just doesn't decide to go do some uh, bad crime uh, toward uh, the female part of society or however you want to put it. But I'm going to say this, it starts down in the heart. The heart does make a difference. That being the case, I am reminded that our Lord told the ladies uh, to dress in modest apparel, right? Amen. And you, you may say, well, Brother Burkholder, it's my business the way I want to dress. It's also your brother's and sister's business if you're a real Christian. And you may say, well, I, I can do what I want to do. In some ways that's true. But whom he loveth, he chasteneth. And you want to remember the business about causing a brother to stumble. It was brought out in the Sunday school lesson this morning for you adults who were in the Sunday school class. And you know, I, I got to tell you, we're, that one illustration that I'm using on the, the business, which I even hate to say the word, but brothers and sisters, we are bombarded day by day with stories, with dirty jokes, with pictures on billboards going down the highway, and yea, with in many cases, uh, the way people dress or don't dress. And you may say, well, show me the scripture and verse. What I'm trying to point out is, take us the foxes, the little foxes. And it's just not on the matter of dress. I want to say this, how you dress, where you go, what you do, how you act, does make a difference. You say, well, it's just a little thing. Well, okay, but the little things mount up. And I want to close by saying this. The child of God ought to be concerned about what the Lord thinks. Now get the Sunday school lesson this morning because it was very well put so I'll save the time on that one. And I'm only given about a very small part of my message this morning so I'm going to have to come back to this. I don't know whether the crowd will be bigger or lower by the time I get back to it. But I want to say this. This is one minister who believes it is his duty to try to rear Christians to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you may say, well, Brother Burke Holder, I don't think it's any of your business. Well, uh, we're in a free country, so you can think the way you want to think. I'll accept this. You've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh. Shall we stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed? Now I realize I haven't brought a salvation message this morning. I've brought more of what I hope to be an edifying, building, educational message for Christians, a thought-provoking message uh, on their lifestyle. But be that as it may, if you're here and you're not saved or you don't know whether you're saved or not, I want to invite you to consider that this morning. And if that's your case, I ask you to do one of two things. Meet me down here at the front. And tell me, Brother Burke Colder, I don't know whether I'm saved, or Brother Burke Colder, I'm not saved, but I want to get it settled. Meet me down here. I'll have a counselor come and show you out of the Bible how to know for sure Jesus Christ is your Savior. Or you can take a position over at the door to my right, and a counselor will come and show you out of the Bible in the 
privacy of the inquiry room how to know for sure the Lord is your Savior. Perhaps you just need to come to the altar and pray. It may not be you've been a wicked, 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 wicked sinner, but there may be something that's troubling you or some person that you might wish to pray for, you're welcome to come to the altar and pray. If you want to pray with me or you want me to pray with you, please come to me personally. May God bless you to know and do His will this morning. And my biggest prayer this morning is that God shall bless the spiritual index of Trinity to be on the rise rather than on the fall. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for thy love and goodness. I commit the invitation now to thee, Lord. Whoever might be here and have a need to come to the altar, I pray thee to show them and lead them. Whoever might be here, Lord, and have another need, I pray thee to show them. And I pray, O oh God, that you might speak to each one of our hearts in a varied way and the right way that each one of us needs to be spoken to by thee, that we might grow in grace and knowledge of thee. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Number 159 in the book if you'd like.